If this guy doesn't show in the next five minutes, then he can forget it. <sighs> Jagad! Hey there, you? I'm afraid I'm waiting for somebody and- Hand over the map, Jagad. I don't have any map. Do you? Nah. Afraid we cannot help you. Fine, then we'll just take you. Oh, no, see, I have another appointment to get to. Boulder. <sighs> Tales from my RPG campaign, Sea of Secrets. Jagad, the archaeologist who hired you to help him find a magic city, had a meeting earlier today, but he was supposed to be back a while ago. In fact, he was supposed to be meeting another potential source of funding in this dead-end alley right about now. I hope Jagad's alright. We may just have to meet this sponsor without him. Are we sure this is the place? Can't see much from this alley. I'll leap up to the rooftop. Well then, I'll vault up with my pole arm. Amulet of the Disc. Uhumisho reaches the second story roof, with Paylor not far behind, and Jinx and Blue riding up on Adria's levitating disc. You find a cloaked figure up there, walking in your direction. She's on the roof. Yep. Hello. Where is Jagad? This guy? We were hoping you knew. Just because this is Bankton, that man thinks he's safe walking around. He'd better not have lost that map of his. He did bring Boulder for protection. Uh, hold on, this is a hard one. I don't know what would have kept Jagad from this meeting. If you are the team he hired, you'd better find him and make sure he's all right. So serious. I walk over to her and dance. recognize that brooch. She's from the Psionic Academy. You finally figure out what was odd about the woman's silhouette. Her right arm is completely missing under that cloak. Surely you could give us a hand in finding him. The Academy offered to cover his entire expedition, but to God refused. He didn't want to answer to anyone. Unfortunately, he's on his own now. Wait, she's missing her left hand? I thought you said her right arm was missing. It is but her left arm ends at the elbow. I may have to dance harder to cheer her up. My contacts at the academy told me that if anything happened to Jagad, I could call you in to help. Make a bluff check. Natural 20, and I have plus 10 on my skill. You are surprisingly convincing, but rolling a 20 still isn't mind control. I don't know what kind of contacts you have, but I only take orders from the director. On the other hand, we're not asking you to intervene, but surely you or your subordinates could use your powers to help locate Jagad. We'll do the rest. I'll see if anyone has heard anything and try to pass word to you, but otherwise, my hands are tied. Oh! With that, she turns and steps back off the far side of the roof. I do hope you find Jagad all right. Wait, did she even give us her name? Nope, she did not. H how do we ask around for Jagad? Short guy, dark skin and hair, thin mustache, th that's every fifth human around here. But he was accompanied by possibly the world's largest dwarf. Good point. I've seen a few dwarfs who could drink a whole keg, but... But Boulder looks like he can eat a keg. Right. He's almost five feet tall and four feet wide. Three feet thick, viewed from the side. They call him Boulder, the world's largest dwarf. He's a hundred pounds of fat and two hundred of muscle. For a fella that size, he sure can't hustle. They call him Boulder, the giant gnome is dwarf. They follow the giant dwarf sightings until the trail dries up. There's a hole in that wall. <gasps> Boulder! Boulder is dead? From the trail of blood. He was trying to drag himself up the stairs. I'd say he died from powerful blunt impacts. Where's Jagad? No sign of him. Not downstairs, anyway. Who lives here? I will check upstairs. Huh. Ooh, found a portrait. They look happy. These rugs have been moved. Look at this mark. Paw prints don't leave straight lines. These were heavy metal boots. Or metal feet. What the heck's going on here? City guards. Wouldn't it be shit if we got blamed for Boulder's murder? 
Officer, I, I'm so glad you're here. I got home to find a dead man on my stairs. A and look what happened to my wall. Oh, what a mess. How long ago did this happen? This guy is self. I have no idea. We just got home minutes ago. These two are going to be great. Jinx and Adria use their disguises and charisma skills to deflect suspicion. Then the whole party escapes up to the roof following a trail of cracked roof tiles. When the trail drops down to an alleyway, they find a couple witnesses who describe something large being loaded into a two-wheeled cart, and armed with that description, they head for the nearby west gate of Bankton. I'll keep to the rooftops. The end of the world is nigh. You make good progress above the crowds, but you do have to drop down here. Do I? Do I, though? How I'd all the streets. Oh, you can leave crossroads and alleys no problem, but the main streets are like 30 feet across. 30 feet? Okay. I can take a 10. I have plus 25 to my jump. Jesus. When they do reach the gates, Adria and Misho ask a busy guard about the cart. I've seen a few carts. I flip him a coin. Two big wheels, two donkeys, beige tarp, and a mechanical. I didn't see the mech, but a uh, two-wheeler, beige cover? Pretty sure one like that turned off the road toward Tamboro. When they reached the halfling suburb, several blue uniformed marshals were questioning a fearful crowd who had clearly evacuated their underground homes in a hurry. Just how many thugs are down there? I, I don't know. I was just trying to get out. What's your stake in this, big folk? We suspect them of kidnapping a friend. And killing another. What's your plan for dealing with this? We're calling for more reinforcements, because it sounds like we're outnumbered. More than five of them. In that little cart. They must have had friends here already. We're gonna be your solution, Marshal. Our friend is down there, and we're gonna get him back. So how much do you marshals pay for outside contractors? Come on, Paylor. The stairs, under an ancient tamarind tree, take them down into an old-style halfling burrow, a dozen or so houses along a maze-like tunnel, five feet below the gardens and subsistence farms. Five and a half foot ceilings? How the hell am I supposed to swing my pole arm? That's what you get for being so damn big. On the other hand, it's the perfect sort of tunnel to keep people at a distance using your weapon's length. Look, dead halflings. At least they took one down for us. The Warrens aren't especially large, but every door they open seems to reveal two more, more than the party can reasonably scout, which allowed a group of bandits to ambush and partially surround them. But most of them are minions, a type of enemy who can be dangerous in numbers, but who die in a single hit. And despite Paylor and Misho's frustration at the confining tunnels, they slash their way through the enemies in short order, while Adria shoots, Blue fries brains with psionic mind thrust, and Jinx looks for a chance to sneak attack. How many of these guys are there? And still no sign of Jagad. I open this door. Flanking the door are a pair of mechs. I close the door. Slam. Now they have to come to us. I'll start my Inspire Courage song and boost it with my magic badge of valor so everybody gets plus two to hit and damage. There's a third mechanical. Attack of opportunity. This is for Boulder. Well, I did barely know him. Yeah, we'll make a will save against 3d10 mental damage. Mallet rolled a 17, so he saved. Rage. Shift. <laughs> I only hit once. Take 13. 13? That's a big hit, but it's going to take a lot more than that. Then the mech with the rapier kicks open the door, and those two, who had delayed their initiative, attack Uhamisho. Take 5 from the rapier, then 10 from this guy, plus a bite for 4 more damage. I'm pretty tough while raging, but that bloodies me. While Jinx keeps up her enchanted song, she and Adria use their magical healing bells to heal Misho a total of 17. Two thugs spill out of another door, but as the first one is cut down by Pillor's attack of opportunity, the second stops, extends a finger, and fires a bolt of energy. Take 5 damage, and make a DC 12 fortitude save or be knocked down. Saved. So Paylor keeps his balance, and actually, the random magic goon almost knocked himself down from the effort. But he also saved. A spellcaster who hits themselves. I move up and trip the big one. Then free attack from improved trip. Well, take 10 damage. I only rolled a 2 to hit, but raging, shifting, flanking, singing against the prone guy. I still hit AC 20. Take 12. 
Then second claw hits for 13, and my bite attack, with all those bonuses, tear at them for another 11 damage. You destroyed Mallet! That was mostly him! The two remaining mechs rally, the rapier-wielding Mithril Mechanical peering off with Uhamisha, while the hammer one with its ironwood jaw crashed into Paylor, beating him down to three hit points while the mercenary's trip checks just kept failing. He tumbled away and Jinx healed him, a pitiful roll of four, but it was just enough to keep Paylor standing when he got hit again the next round. Blue blasted the spellcasting thug, launching him into a wall, but when Misho gets stabbed again, the shifter tears that mithril alloy body apart, and Paylor gives up tripping and straight up chops the wooden humanoid in half. What was that force blast? That didn't look like spellcasting to me. More like some kind of innate power? Didn't seem that well controlled either. He almost knocked himself on his ass. I've still got a few rounds left on my rage. Do we push forward? I'm still bloodied, but I'm pretty tough. All right then. I charge through this door. Uhamisho smashes through a makeshift barricade into a large room with a half dozen goons plus an old man leaning over Jagad who is bound to a table. Another smaller figure immediately bolts out a far door. I hoped that noise was you guys. Good job. You're doing really well. Ugh, this may all have been for nothing. As Paylor cuts down the thug nearest the door, the old human casts Bless upon the mercenaries before running for the door himself. Well, running is relative. He starts slowly moving to the door. These three throw knives at you guys, but even with the plus one to hit, they all miss. I climb up on the barricade, and Psionic push this guy for 11 cold damage, launching him back into the doorway. A roll of reflex save for old man... Nope. You blast the corpse right into the cleric, knocking him down. The rest of them attack, Uhamisho tossing thugs aside as though there were no difference between the one hit point minions and proper 11 hit point goons. By the time the old man was able to get out from under the frozen corpse, it was practically over. And I cold blast him into the wall. This escalated very fast. Damn, I, I, I really don't want to have to kill everyone. I don't really have a non-lethal option though. I untied your god. We get a cash bonus for this, right? Uh, I'll arrange something. It's fine. Who are all these goons? A handful of them have markings from local street gangs. Most don't. Nobody I know. No professionals. No professional what? Mercenaries. What did they want with you, Jakad? This guy here, and that one-eyed gnome, asked me question after question. Where is the map? Where is the city? What direction will you travel? A lot of the same questions as you guys, actually. You guys still have the grapefruit. Right? I have it right here. Good, good. I feel kind of bad about Boulder. But uh, you guys seem really effective. Let's keep moving. That gnome's getting away. You open a door and find a trio of charm. With the scarred man under his mental sway, Blue tries to convince the others to surrender, and Jinx joins in by impersonating the old man, but a thug from the next room berates the freaks into attacking with their wonky powers. This one breathes out a cube of noxious gas, basically stinking cloud spell, on Blue and Charmed Guy, who saves and runs out of the cloud, but the caster fails his save and is affected himself. Okay. This one waves her hands at you guys, unleashing a cone of flame. Four damage. Reflex 12 for half. You are mildly warmed. And she actually lights herself on fire and goes down. What? They'll have that backlash bullshit. Like the guy who force blasted me. I don't think I even want to steal spells from these guys if they can't control their powers. Then the stinking cloud dissipates, leaving Blue totally unaffected since he doesn't breathe. You don't breathe? <laughs> I love this character. Whoa. You're cornered. Just put down your weapons so we don't have to kill you, like this guy. What are you afraid of? He's just a defective freak like them. He charges blue. Too late. <laughs> you hear blades clattering to the ground. We give, we give. They ain't paying us that much. Between the two terrified thugs and the charmed guy, they learned that the ones with powers were experimental subjects from some kind of lab run by the one-eyed gnome, but the hired goons knew essentially nothing of their employers, and number 58 knew hardly anything about the world outside the lab, and no idea how to find it without the master. The halfling villagers, still milling around near the front entrance, spot the party emerging, bloody but triumphant, and a couple of marshals come over to arrest the three prisoners. Did you see a gnome with an eye patch? He came out the same exit, mounted and fled. 
We sent two officers in pursuit, but our ponies couldn't keep pace with your gnome's full-sized horse. The mastermind was gone, but they had rescued their boss and saved the halflings of Tamboril, which also earned them a pair of homemade pies. Pie sounds good. Do the halflings have any custard? Well, this whole episode has been unpleasant. Let's get back to the crystal umbrella. Oh, Bayin is probably pissed off that I missed our meeting. Though being kidnapped is a pretty good excuse. Let's go with that. Bayin? Is she the one from the Psionic Academy? She's a little short-handed. You could say that. Was she angry? I'd be angry if I was missing both my hands. I don't think you can miss something you were born without. She didn't really care for my dancing. Why, why was there dancing? You guys are getting close to the inn when you spot some motion in an alleyway. A fish person in armor, who appears to be beckoning to Jagad. I guess we are having a conversation? I've never seen an illud before. This five foot tall amphibious fish person has large complex eyes which seem to be constantly refocusing, or perhaps tracking motion behind you. Their shield bears the crest of the illud republic, which makes sense because the other faction of this species, the ball worshipping diluvians, are not exactly welcome here. You are Jagad, correct? Yes. What is this about? Ambassador Bolrod requests your attendance at the Illud Embassy tomorrow. Someone on the Council seems to think your expedition will pass through Illud waters. An envoy is being assigned to accompany and assist you on your journey. Is this assistance optional? It is not. So make sure that you are in Bankton tomorrow morning to receive the order. I see. Please, thank the ambassador for the invitation. Ugh. The gruff messenger turns, and as they begin to walk away, they activate the sinister alchemical device for which the Diluvians and Illud are so feared. An invisibility cloak. Charming. Yeah, I'm out of PowerPoints, I don't give a shit. Man, I gotta get one of those cloaks. Wouldn't work for you, it's powered by chemicals they secrete through their skin. Okay... So... Who are we working for now? We are sure as hell not working for them. Let's get back to the inn and pack up. We leave town tonight. Next time on Tales from My RPG Campaign. Before the post credit scene, I'd like to thank all my patrons for making this possible, especially the members of the organization. If you're looking for more Tales from My RPG Campaign, good news! I've done a whole other series. Same world, same players, different characters. The production quality is bumpy at the start, but stick with it, it gets better. Subscribe for more, patreon.com slash demonac, or just share this to support me. And please remember to like every episode of Sea of Secrets, so I don't have to do this sales pitch again. They'll get to the boats eventually. He's almost five feet tall and four feet wide. Three feet thick viewed from the side. They call him Boulder, the world's largest dwarf. He's a hundred pounds of fat and two hundred of muscle. For a fella that size, he sure can't hustle. They call him Boulder, the giant gnome is dwarf. He protects your guide on a trip to the mall till a magnate mouse smashed through.